You've been going through something of a restructuring of your company ever since you took over. Tell us where you are in that restructuring. What stands between you and getting that large portion of your operations out of bankruptcy? Well, we still have two gating factors. One is just having all the regulators approve the restructuring plan, which was approved by the judge on January 17th. We also need to have the SEC finalize their comments on our restructuring, and then once both of those gates are passed, we'll be emerging. We're, we're expecting that by the end of the third quarter, we'll, we'll have emerged uh, from bankruptcy. So by the end of the third quarter, and at that point, as you look forward as best you can, are you going to be positioned so that your debt is not so overwhelming so you can really make a success? business of this? Yes, oh yeah. We, we've actually had an outstanding two years. Um, our EBITDA over the last two years while we've been in bankruptcy is up $756 million, uh, about an 800 basis points margin improvement over the last two years. And we've actually taken share on the strip and uh, employee satisfaction, customer satisfaction are both at an all-time high. So we feel the management team has done a really great job uh, really pulling together over the last couple years and getting ready to emerge. and very excited about it because we think there's a lot of growth plans that we haven't been able to act on because of the kind of complicated structure. But once we emerge, we'll be able to do an awful lot of uh, inorganic type growth plans, development projects around the world, as well as M&A activity. So let's take us through those growth plans, if you would, Mark. Where are the principal areas of growth that you're looking forward to? Is it geographic? Well, we, uh, we have both geographic growth. I mean, we have projects right now underway in, in Brazil when those licenses are issued. We're looking at Japan. We've got uh, Toronto. Uh, and, and, you know, so those are projects that are actually still right now, you know, just ready to be activated. We also have on the strip, we have a lot of real estate still that's un, under I'll say utilize, it's just blank. So there's a, about a 50 acre parcel behind Bally's and then we got about a 30 acre parcel that's also behind the link uh, in the high roller. And then there's seven acres right in front of Caesars Palace. And we have plans to basically develop all of that very, very valuable center strip property um, as soon as we emerge. So uh, th those, uh, those assets, uh, will have very high return, very low risk type profile projects on them. So I want to talk about the real estate, but before that, just one last question on geography. What about Macau? When most of us really pay attention to gambling, we hear a lot about growth in Macau. Are you planning on trying to get back in there? As I understand Caesars, I think before you were there, tried to get in and didn't. Yeah, you know, Macau is something we strategically have never entered, and, and sure, we would have loved to have been there. I think uh, what we look at is being in Asia through other projects that we have. We have a Korean uh, license that uh, will develop by 2020. That's in Incheon, Korea. We have Japan. Obviously, I've been over there, and they really like us, and they're very interested in us uh, being one of their license holders. Probably 11 to 13 licenses over there, and the foreign ministers over there actually like the fact that we hadn't been in Macau because we have to be very regulatory and compliant in the jurisdictions we're here in the United States, and they love our compliance strength and the fact that we're kind of a benchmark on compliance issues. So, so we think we've got a really good shot at Japan, just given the fact because we're not in Macau, and they, they pointed that out to us. So I was pleasantly surprised on that front. So, so Mark, looking at your numbers, last year it looked like about 58% of your revenue came out of gaming. When you talk about that sort of extensive real estate development, when you get past that, will the balance of your company look different? Will you be more of a real estate company than you are now? Well, I think, you know, the way that a company will be structured post-emergence is uh, the same, and it'll have a REIT structure, and then we will, we will be the property company. We'll pay a lease to the REIT structure, and uh, essentially, we still own the brands. We're the license holders. We own Total Rewards, and, um, and so the REIT structure actually provides a very effective way for us to develop uh, around the world and do M&A, so it's, uh, it provides a very good liquidity for us. So we think, again, we'll have lots of liquidity. And, and in terms of uh, you know where we'll get our revenues, we're growing very fast right now on the hotel end of the business. And on the strip, you actually make more money on the hotel business from a margin standpoint than you do the gaming business. So we like that trend. We like the fact that we're growing very fast. Our, our average daily rate on rooms is, uh, is, has grown about 11% CAGR over the last couple of years. And uh, that compares to the strip average of around 5 to 6%. Uh, that'll continue because we continue to renovate a lot of those rooms. We're doing 
7,000 rooms right now this year. And up until 2020, we'll continue to get up to about 90% of those rooms renovated. We have about 24,000 rooms on the Strip today. So again, Las Vegas has very good dynamics. Post-bankruptcy, 66% of our EBITDA will come directly from Las Vegas. So at, that, at this point, most of the analysts think that's a good thing, you know, given the right. fact that our, we have a high concentration right. in so, Vegas. So, so Mark, as you look around as CEO, who do you see as your principal competitor and what do you identify as your competitive advantage against that competitor? So, you know, the most like, I guess, size competitor would be MGM. Um, you know, on a, on a domestic basis, we're the largest gaming uh, provider in, in the United States. We have the most number of locations. So our biggest source of leverage is the fact that our size allows our total rewards program to be very powerful. We have 50 million total rewards members. And because our network is so large, you know, it makes it very hard uh, for other people to compete with that kind of a reward program. It's one of the best CRM programs also in the world, so we're heavy on data analytics on our customers, and we, we happen to make an awful lot of money per customer because we concentrate on, on customers that like to gamble, and so we feel that's an advantage, and that advantage can be turned into the hotel side of the business as well, where we're starting to overweight, if you will, the points that you accrue in total rewards on the hotel side of the business. So again, we think that's a big opportunity for us to continue to grow the FIT customer with, uh, with our total rewards program. Finally, Mark, and this that's is a that is one of our key advantages. Yeah. So fi finally, this is a bigger subject. You have to go back and talk to us about it. But just give us a taste. When you look at the millennials, are you getting them into the casinos or is that an online play for you? How are you making that play? So we look at millennials. We're, you know, obviously trying to engage them digitally. We're trying to engage them through PDAs, mobile. Um, we have a lot of advanced technology projects in the works that will launch inside the four walls of our casinos today that will engage and activate the millennials in a way they want to be engaged and activated. We're trying to take an awful lot of what we call our social mobile protocol that we know that they enjoy and, uh, and be able to, to translate that into the same type of software into the games that we're starting to put on the floor. So we have a, a project called Casino of the Future that will launch probably within the year. And, um, and you know, we want to be first to innovate in, uh, in gaming by providing new games that are different, that are more interactive, more skill-based, right. and, uh, and, and attract that millennial generation. But believe it or not, millennials today, 50, roughly 56% of them are gamers already. So wow. they actually match the wow. baby boomers in terms of the total percentage. Yeah. And, and millennials today are 34% of the workforce. So again, we, we want to attract them, but yeah. they have a predisposition to game anyway. So right. we like that. 